The Illinois General Assembly is on spring break. What have legislators accomplished and what do they have left to do? We'll talk about it next on Capitol View. Welcome to Capital View, the weekly program about Illinois government and how it might just affect you and your life. Joining us this week on Capital View is David Dahl, reporter for WTAX Radio. Welcome, Dave. Hello. Great. And also, Hannah Meisel, reporter for Springfield version of 4Law 360. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, thanks both for coming. Um, first off, we are now in spring break in the Illinois legislature, and so perhaps it's time to uh, see uh, wh where we've been, uh, where we are right now, and where we might be going. Uh, first off, um, I don't mean to ask a loaded question, but what have we accomplished so far in the uh, first half of the legislative session? Uh, uh, have we set any sorts of, uh, of uh, groundwork to, uh, for things to come up later? Uh, have we accomplished more than we thought we might do? You know, every, every legislative calendar, we are a state that does a five-month legislative calendar, mm -hmm. um, plus a bit in the fall. And, you know, it's not that different um, from most years that the bulk of the action is going to come in the last four or five weeks of session. Mm -hmm. You know, May is crunch time. Mm -hmm. um, I might even argue that this year, because we had uh, such... Um, big and public negotiations over the Senate's grand bargain that we might have even had a more productive uh, legislative session in the first half before mm -hmm. spring break um, because you know lawmakers flex negotiation muscles that they haven't had to flex in uh, the stalemate Bruce Rauner era and before that in Democratic controlled era you know the only notable ex exception I can think of is pension reform but that's mm -hmm. for five years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, you know, they have done, you know, the grand bargain, it's dead or it's on its very last breaths and no one is there by its side as it's dying. Mm -hmm. um, but besides, you know, ignoring that failure overall, I still think that there's been some movement and that's going to affect lawmakers going forward. And then th there's also been some, you know, non-budget bills that have had you know traction just as in every year. For example, Senator Kwame Roll has a gun sentencing bill that has um, moved forward. There is a internet privacy bill. Mm -hmm. There's a handful of other bills that you know they have gained traction. Whether or not they ultimately see the governor's desk is to be seen. But I'd say it's been a fairly productive session, mm -hmm. um, barring the fact that we still are in, what is it now, the 21st month with no budget, 22nd? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, give or take. Um, the apparent death, or, or, or at least uh, putting on life support of the grand bargain, uh, did this uh, uh, take the wind out of any sails here, or was this somewhat expected? I mean, what do you, what do you think, Mr. Dahl? I mean, uh, uh, is, this, is this going to uh, uh, have any kind of material effect on the second half of the session, what, what, what failed to happen, frankly, in February? I think the easiest thing to say is it's too early to tell. Uh, as Hannah was saying, uh, there has been some progress, at least in terms of some negotiations. You could say they didn't get anywhere. And if we get to May 31st and haven't made any progress from now, you could say, yeah, they didn't go anywhere. But it's possible that some of the grand bargain bills, they could revisit and say, you know, we negotiated this far. Let's just pick up where we left off on the negotiating and, you know, get to a conclusion. On the other hand, uh, you could say the only job they have is to get a budget together. And until they do that, you could say they haven't accomplished the one thing they're supposed to do. And it's the kind of thing where if you look through it through that prism, uh, you can't say there's any progress until it's done, which mm -hmm. would be May 31st. So in that sense, I think uh, uh, if you were to grade the General Assembly in 2017, it might be a, a gentleman's incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, if we could go back to something you mentioned, Hannah, and that is the gun sentencing uh, 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 legislation that, that appears to have gotten some degree of traction. I have heard an argument here that that uh, if we increase uh, uh, sentences for, for, for gun offenses, that that might undercut, uh, to some extent, efforts to to uh, reduce the state prison population and, 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 and do some prison reform. Have you been hearing anything along those lines? And if, if, if so, how might that play into the future of this bill? 
Sure. I mean, like you said, the governor has um, been, you know, pretty forward with his plans to reduce the state's prison population, which is, you know, has been for years well over 100 percent capacity. Mm -hmm. You know, holding a prison, uh, holding someone in prison costs the state much, much, much more than, um, you know, other means of justice, whether yeah. it be, you know, uh, supervised, you know, house arrest or, you know, other what they might call restorative justice kind of uh, yeah. things like that. Um, but the the bill's sponsor, Senator Kwame Roll, he um, he has he's had some fiery responses to mm -hmm. those who um, you know criticize his point of view mm -hmm. that um, you know people uh, people will be deterred um, you know from gun crimes from mm -hmm. having guns when they're not supposed to from no. you know uh, attempted murder or murder um, sure. with guns legal or not. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, he, when it, whenever it was when uh, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson was down in Springfield um, and there was a massive hearing on this bill, you know, uh, Kwame Raul got some flack from legislators um, from other sides of Chicago. Um, Kwame Raul is from the Hyde Park area, which is the south side, but you know, fairly middle class, even affluent, um, and you know, other lawmakers who are from the uh, deep south side, the west side, where murder rates um, have been just off the yeah, off, off, off the charts, the charts yeah. and just tragic. Yeah. You know, they they say you know this won't work, and he that you know with all due respect, we you know we really want this to pass. We think that this is the right choice. Yeah. Um, but like you said, it's always a struggle between uh, budget considerations for prisons, um, you know, budget considerations for recidivism rates um, and, you know, other types of justice. But then also, what are we going to do to stop the bloodshed in Chicago? Yeah, sure. And, you know, my understanding now, the uh, request for Department of Corrections is right around $1.5 billion, which would be an increase, I think, in the neighborhood of $300, $400 million uh, a year and with fewer inmates if, if these projections go forward uh, to take care of. Uh, uh, the line of thinking I've heard is that we need to improve such things as uh, uh, mental health care for, 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 for inmates uh, uh, because we have not been doing the job that we should in the past. Dave, I mean, with regard to, to the receptive, you know, how legislators are going to, you know, accept some kind of a proposal to increase the Department of Corrections uh, uh, budget. Is that on anybody's radar screen now or is it just too early to tell how that's going to shake out? Well, you've identified the conflict, I think, uh, aptly because uh, with prisons, I mean, there's a finite amount of prison space thinning out the prison population and this speaks a little bit to pot legalization, mm -hmm. saving prison for the worst of the worst. Yeah. On the other hand, I especially if you're in Chicago, you can't be in the wrong place on this uh, uh, violence that we're having. We're going to have another long, hot summer, I would sure. think, up there. And uh, you don't want to look as if you're doing nothing. And uh, besides the political point, it's darn scary. Yeah. So I think it's a, a kind of a precarious position for a, a lawmaker to be in. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard the exact arguments you've, you're talking about, but uh, Senator Raul did uh, drop some of the uh, drug-related points of his bill mm -hmm. to make it more palatable. Uh, I, I don't think that earned him even one more vote on it, but yeah. nevertheless, uh, uh, they did uh, call it for a vote and run it through the Senate recently. Okay, great. Uh, speaking of pot, we have, uh, and you did mention it in passing, we have a Democratic uh, candidate for governor, J.B. Pritzker, coming out in favor of legalization of marijuana. Uh, is that, should we be surprised by that? Uh, or is this, uh, what does this signal, if anything, in terms of the marijuana issue coming up in, in the gubernatorial race about prospects for a bill now to, to, to uh, uh, make marijuana legal for recreational use? Well, I think uh, that uh, sweet smell you uh, notice is the smell of money. <laughs> it's something that Illinois needs. And you look so at all the green places, candidates. You look at all the places that are that have legalized it and are taxing the heck out of it. Um, you know, I think the the toothpaste is out of the barn door on that one. With so many states already legalizing recreational pot, no one's interested in busting a kid that has a joint in his pocket. Sure. Uh, it's 2017, and 
uh, there is, in my view, a, a valid argument against it, mm -hmm. uh, legalizing marijuana. But they're talking about it now, and, and it could be one of those things like uh, same-sex marriage where uh, you wonder, well, what took so long, and I can't believe that this was such a big deal. Sure. I mean, Justin Trudeau just today in Canada introduced a bill to legalize marijuana nationwide uh, uh, north of the border. Uh, and so what I, you know, again, uh, well, not again, but uh, Governor Rauner has signaled that he doesn't think it's such a good idea. Hannah, I mean, what do you think? Well, I mean, you also have the federal consideration, you know, uh, marijuana is still illegal federally. You have dispensaries who, you know, try to go to one bank to open up accounts and they say, no, sorry, like that's going to run uh, against uh, federal laws. We don't want to get in trouble. But, you know, like was Dave was saying, it's one of those things that opinion has changed. Um, you know, it was slowly going up for a long time and I feel like recently it's gone up very, very rapidly. I was just in Colorado a couple of year, uh, years, uh, weeks ago. You can't we believe. We won't tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> we, you can't believe the amount of money that that state has made yeah. um, through legalization, through um, collecting the tax revenue that they were. You know, it was they could not capture any of that before, and now they're capturing so much. How mm -hmm. expensive? I think we mentioned the governor. <laughs> At some point, he's going to have to explain how he doesn't want to legalize marijuana, but he does want to do uh, sentencing and criminal justice because at some point, those are going to collide. Sure, yeah. And it would seem to a lot of folks, I think that's kind of low-hanging fruit in mm -hmm. terms of trying to reduce the prison population if you get rid of nonviolent uh, drug offenders, particularly on, on, on the mar on when we're talking about marijuana, that would seem to be uh, a, l a lot of power to, to, to perhaps that argument. Uh, I, I did mention uh, uh, J.B. Pritzker. Perhaps we should give the other four announced uh, candidates for uh, uh, governor on the Democratic side their due. Uh, Dave, you were very impressive uh, uh, before we started taping and you were able to just rattle down the list. <laughs> uh, can you do it again for us? Well, you have J.B. Pritzker mm -hmm. and Chris Kennedy mm -hmm. and Daniel Biss and Bob Diber mm -hmm. and Amea Pawar, okay. an alderman. Now, we talked, uh, and again, it might have been off the air. This is why I don't mm -hmm. like talking to you off the air because I can't remember what we did that was on and off. <laughs> but it's all on the record. Going, going from the legislature to the governor's mansion. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine going from an alderman to the governor's mansion? That would be tough as well. Yeah. Uh, so you've got five that are announced, and you've got one uh, local state senator, Andy Menar, who did think about it and said, I'm not going to do it. He's going to stay in the state senate. Of course, he wouldn't have had to give up a seat. Well, Biss does. Biss does, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, you, you've got five that are, um, I don't know if anyone will climb on and join them or not. Scott Drury's threatening to, but, you know, maybe the three of us are too, I think, if you're... <laughs> Th thinking about it doesn't count. Well, if history holds, the three of us would have a better chance than either uh, Senator Biss or uh, Representative Drury. Uh, the last uh, uh, Illinois legislator to go directly to the governor's mansion would be... Uh, I wish Bernie Schoenberg was here. He'd probably know. He or, would know. Yeah, uh, well, those are words that you don't hear in that order very often. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you don't. And so it would seem to be somewhat an uphill climb, almost you know, like a U.S. senator going, becoming president. That doesn't happen very often either. Hmm. Except for that one time. Well, there was there was a candidate. <laughs> You've got a record to uh, run on. Barack You've Obama. taken a number of votes. Oh, I take it back. I take it back. I'm sorry. I am absolutely sorry. Uh, <laughs> boom. You've got to be known statewide. It's a statewide race, 102 counties. And so uh, I think it'll be interesting to see how the Democrats play it and whether they'll coalesce behind the winner and uh, go up against Governor Rauner. It seems interesting to me that with the exception of uh, Bob uh, uh, Diber. Diber, yeah, these were, were clustered around uh, 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 Chicago here. There's not somebody so far who's emerged who seems to be a strong candidate uh, uh, f who's from downstate or not perceived as being from, from, from the Chicago area. Is it, will we see somebody? I mean, Menard took himself out and he would have been the most likely uh, uh, suspect, so to speak. Uh, uh, is there anybody else who might, who might come up? Well, uh, Frerix is from Champaign, but he's already said he's not going to do right. it. He wants to run for treasurer again. Mm -hmm. uh, Menar, we've mentioned, is uh, probably not ready for uh, that kind of prime time. He's gotten mm -hmm. his name out quite a bit with the school funding, which is something I suspect we'll be talking about some more. Yeah. Your, your downstate Democrat bench, another one who uh, I was discounting people who were thinking about it, but one who has now said that uh, she wouldn't is Sherry Bustos. 
mm -hmm. and uh, the congresswoman for the Quad Cities is yeah. from here. Yeah. And uh, it's uh, Jean Callahan's daughter. Yeah. And uh, she would have been the first uh, woman governor if she were to get to the mansion. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, and how would this play for uh, uh, the governor if, in fact, he ends up running against a, uh, a Chicago Democrat? Is that something that he would welcome, or or would, would he be a bit uh, more concerned if his if his if his opponent were from downstate or central? He beat a Chicago Democrat who is an incumbent, and mm -hmm. I think he's ready for anything. Mm -hmm. I think he's got fifty million reasons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When do you think the governor will start his campaign? Gee, I wonder. Maybe uh, 2013, 2012 or so. Yeah, okay. It's nonstop. It's nonstop. Because he's been on the road this week. Right. Um, he was he was on the road uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. He um, he spent all over the state of Illinois. He started in the Chicago suburbs. Yeah. And these two days of travel he paid for with his campaign uh -huh. fund. It uh, was solely campaign staff. Um, even I, you know, I follow the governor on Snapchat as a good millennial okay. would. All right. And their the Rauner campaign had made a Snapchat filter, and those things, uh, you know, they cost money. So hmm. all of these things are campaign money. So one might think that the governor is running, hmm. um, but he said, you know, specifically, this has nothing to do with the election. Really, nothing to do with nothing the election. Nothing to do with oh. the election. But oh. you know what, though, is that. You know, a, f a frequent uh, criticism of the governor since he got elected is that he never stopped campaigning. Mm -hmm. So what, how is this really all that different from mm -hmm. the statewide tours he does on mm -hmm. the taxpayer dime, mm -hmm. you know, trying to convince people to support his turnaround agenda? Mm -hmm. It was the same message in, you know, on Tuesday and Wednesday. So really it's not that different. And I don't think it really matters all that much. Mm -hmm. He already told the Tribune editorial board last summer that he will plan to run again. Sure. He and said at the beginning, this is an eight year thing. Yeah. He put yeah. $50 million in his own campaign and I don't think he'd spent any of it yet. Okay. Uh, I think the whole question, I agree with Hannah, that uh, is it a campaign uh, tour or not? Number one, of course it is, because everything sure. is. Everything's connected to everything else, right. and it doesn't matter. I think yeah. what's really rich, uh, pardon the pun, is <laughs> that you're giving money to uh, the candidates, the legislative candidates, but then you're not interested in how it's spent when uh, the legislative candidates are going after one another in various attention-getting fashions, uh, some of which are a little on the negative side. Uh, the governor professes to know nothing about it and hasn't followed it, yet he's the chief funder of the Republican Party. Yeah. And, you know, if I were to, you know, put 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars into something, I, I, I might revisit it and keep an eye on it and see how it's doing. Not Bruce Rauner. But yes, I mean, it's clear yes, to most do. folks. Oh, well. Overly, it's your brand. <laughs> <laughs> well, but most folks looking at this would say, obviously, yes. What you two have said, he, he's campaigning. So why does he say that he, he's not campaigning? Why does he say for you know he's also got these commercials that are out and, and, and saying uh, uh, much of what we heard uh, uh, two years ago now when he was running for governor in 2014 looks like a campaign, smells like a campaign, quacks like a campaign, flies like a campaign, and he's also putting out these things about how he's got a balanced budget. When that I believe Pol Politico called that a pants on fire. Uh, uh, just uh, absolutely demonstrably untrue. I guess what I'm leading up to here is folks who follow this sorts of thing like we do can look at this and say, balderdash, this, is, this, is, this can't possibly be true, yet the governor's out there saying it. Why would he do that? Will it ever come back to hurt him uh, on, the, on the electorate? Well, the only thing I can think of is to try to avoid the criticism of, oh, the state has a budget and the governor's out campaigning already. You know, the governor is unlikely to be primaried. He's not mm -hmm. going to be contested, you would think, until mm -hmm. November of 2018, which is well over a year away. Mm -hmm. And look, he's campaigning, he's campaigning, and we've got all these problems. Um, the only thing I can think of, as I said, is he's trying to avoid that tag. And when he says it enough times, and he says we have a balanced budget enough times, and, uh, you know, uh, another good friend of ours, Rich Miller, has mm -hmm. pointed out in the uh, Capital Facts, that when the governor goes around the state, he tends to get quite favorable, unquestioning press coverage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Except much of the time in Springfield and much of the time in Chicago. When he goes to Quincy, Champaign, the Quad Cities, uh, it's pretty much a, a friendly crowd and uh, the governor is quite adept at giving the answer he wants regardless of the question. and. Uh, 
there's usually not a follow-up. In fact, in Rockford, now this was a few months ago, yeah. he had a thing at a school in Rockford, and he said, are there any questions from reporters? No? Okay, thanks. Is this a not criticism of the press? Is this a, uh, an observation of Rauner's political skills? I mean, what explains that sort of thing? Well, probably both. I think unless you're in the if you're happily in the weeds of it like we are, mm -hmm. uh, we're following it and paying attention and mm -hmm. seeing how the process works or it doesn't. I mean, again, you've got 177 lawmakers and how many of them are really players? Yet all of them go back to their home district and say, oh, well, you know, I'm you know, the way I do it down there. And <laughs> yeah, they're, all, they're all big down there and, and mm -hmm. most of the people in the, uh, the rest of Illinois Mm -hmm. uh, probably aren't following it as closely as they're following their own local issues. Sure, and, I, and I, my guess is, in fact, I, I would bet any amount of money, nobody's really following the gubernatorial race not right now except for insiders and, and, right, and, and right. Yeah, the, at the average Joe. But what I mean is when the governor says, uh, you know, I'm uh, uh, putting together a balanced budget and uh, the Democrats have blocked me, uh, a reporter in Carbondale or Champaign or Quincy is more likely to repeat that verbatim and not question it yeah. than a reporter in Springfield or Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rich has put together a number of these where it's just, um, you know, quite favorable coverage mm -hmm. of the day the governor came to town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about shift gears just a second. This is kind of a miniature. I'm not sure what whether to call it a mini scandal or a mini controversy. This has to do with the Barney's Furniture Building here in Springfield. Uh, for those who haven't kept up with this, uh, the state has just entered into a lease, I believe, in the area of 2.4 million dollars for a five-year lease to uh, store uh, paper files in this building. Uh, the building uh, was the former home of uh, Barney's Furniture, which moved into new premises, oh, about a year ago. And one of the reasons they moved, apparently, was that they felt there was more traffic. Their business prospects were better in a different part of town uh, uh, than where their old building was at. So the building was uh, purchased, uh, well, there was, there was an option to purchase for in the area, I believe, and it turns out that the purchaser has ties to Bill Salini. Uh, it was the purchaser has ties to New Frontier Company, which has long been owned by Mr. Salini. Uh, folks in Springfield definitely know who Mr. Bill Salini is. It's now owned by his, uh, I believe, his daughter and, and his son, but still closely held. Uh, and so folks are starting to say, well, why is the state uh, uh, entering into a $2.4 million lease for a building they could have bought for $700 or so? Uh, they're also questioning at least some folks. This sure sounds Sounds like the old sorts of things that used to happen. You know, Rauner said he was going to come up and shake up Springfield. Here we are at a budget impasse, and folks can't get the medical care they need. Uh, uh, there's been numerous stories about uh, social service agencies that are really hurting, and here comes uh, the Rauner administration giving 2.4 million dollars to a company controlled by Bill, uh, the Salini family, to store paper. Yeah, the uh, governor could take time out from his uncampaign, take time out from his not campaigning to pay attention to this. Well, do you think? Is this something that he would have known about it? Because the governor did on the campaign trail in 2014 say specifically that he tried to distance himself with, from, from Bill Salini uh, uh, somewhere on the campaign trail because Mr. Salini had been convicted of corruption charges uh, in, dealing with, in his dealings with the Blagojevich administration. You could argue the state's not in the position to buy a $700,000 building, mm -hmm. uh, which is why a lot of times. Uh, you know, landlords are, uh, uh, what's the word I'm thinking for, confiscatory, taking advantage of people who can't afford to get out of the apartment game. Mm -hmm. This may be no different. And, uh, you know, as, uh, as they say, it's always somebody's somebody. Yeah. And uh, it, it may be above board. It certainly mm -hmm. gives us something to talk about. Senator Menard has been uh, lead, uh, pushing this issue quite a bit. Is he doing it for political reasons or some other reason? All the above. Okay, great. Uh, speaking of Menar, uh, Senator Menar, uh, school funding has been near and dear to his heart uh, for a number of years now. He's 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 worked that issue. Uh, I don't want to say to death, but but it's, it's been one of his lead ones. Uh, now there's another proposal that has come up for school funding uh, that was announced, I think, just yesterday. Hannah, can you tell us yeah. what's going on with that? Uh, Senator Jason Barrickman from Bloomington. He um, he came out with. Uh, not any bill language yet that we saw, um, but you know he had a press conference in Springfield. Um, it's the result of this bipartisan commission mm -hmm. on school funding. Uh, the formula, basically, for those who don't know, um, Illinois' school funding formula relies very, very heavily on property taxes so that uh, your 
zip code might determine the quality of education yeah. that you get. So anyway, um, Senator Barrickman came out with his, uh, at least the outlines of a formula, it would determine a school district's need based on 27 different uh, properties, qualifications that you might have as a school district. Um, another major thing it does is it gets rid of the Chicago Public Schools block grant mm -hmm. and instead uh, provides pension parity so that you know they won't have the block grant money mm -hmm. but then they will probably break about even with pension parity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but this, it's so complicated. Like we've <laughs> seen over the last three years, um, you know, Senator Barrickman said himself mm -hmm. that he didn't want to, you know, have lawmakers like itching to get a hold of a spreadsheet that says which school districts in their area, you know, will be affected either negatively or positively. So he put some, um, you know, holds in the legislation mm -hmm. to not make that happen. Mm -hmm. But that's always going to happen. That's yeah. always going to be a big consideration because yeah. the school districts are a major part of communities yeah. and they, those people vote. Yeah, well, I mean, the question ultimately is, does this have legs? And this is a proposal coming from a Republican and mm -hmm. from, from Bloomington. Uh, and after we've had a Democratic senator, I think, working on it for a number of years. And as you say, it, it, it's extremely complicated stuff. And, 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 you know, I guess I personally wonder, you know, why now? And, 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 and what are the prospects? Uh, Dave, any thoughts on that along those lines? This is the kind of thing that's very complicated to pass. And... It may not pass this year, be it the Barrickman version or the Menara version. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, with, with that said, we're almost out of time. And so interesting discussion this week. Thanks both for coming. And thank you for watching us here on Capital View.